So Dr. James Canton with me in Mill Valley, California. I'm Gerd Leonhard, we're both futurists. Uh, I'm based in Switzerland and we collaborate on some projects together. Today a short interview and we want to talk about sustainability, so-called sustainability, whatever that is. Do you want, do you want to take a uh, Sure. So uh, sustainability is uh, its kind of like the word globalization. It means a lot of different things to different people. Um, sustainability, I think, has to do with everything from you know the, the, the sustainability of uh, social accountability that the business practices or organization practices are in keeping with law and, and, and right ethics, but also being attentive to the environment and being not a polluter, uh, but a conserver, but also one that is paying attention to all dynamics of your supply chain, to your people, to what kind of waste or products you make that either contribute to a carbon footprint or they reduce the carbon footprint. I think this is a big part of what sustainability is today. And what, of course, our, our practice is, is to try to help companies and governments understand that, or the sustainable planet and how that's important, certainly, to over 98% of the public, whether you're in Europe or the United States. Yeah, I think that you know, I'm trying to define this with my, you know, I have clients like the WWF, the World Wildlife Foundation, and Unilever and others, and you have some of the same, I think, as well. But some of the key questions here are, you know, we've had the system to where profit and growth was it. I mean, basically, the only thing that really mattered was profit and growth for your company, for yourself, for countries. Uh, and that is shifting because it's quite clear that we've reached a, a glass ceiling to you cannot grow 10% a year as a company when, when your company already has 50,000 employees, you know. That is quite hard to do. So you, we've grown from a higher place, you know, unlike, say, Brazil or India. You know where they can still grow in this way. Right. So the problem is that if we're shifting away from this profit and growth to some sort of uh, more, more like a value circle than a value chain, right? So we're going around in circles trying to find other ways to grow like this rather mm -hmm. than to grow like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really changes the paradigm. I think ultimately it probably means the demise of the stock market as a, as a, as a symbol of growth because that is only trained towards a, a, a one-way growth rather than lateral Way. So that is a major challenge for financial markets. You know, this idea of the invisible hand, you know, the, the idea that whatever makes money will ultimately happen because it, it's good for everyone, that has completely failed us, for example, with climate change. You know, there's, well, there's clearly lots of money in, yeah. in doing this, but nobody has actually done it well, for other reasons. So, so right. let me uh, push back on that, right? Suggest another model. One right. of the things that we as futurists do is we don't necessarily. Uh, we try not to be opinionated, but we try to look at different various scenarios of which some may work, some may not. It's the way that yeah. we can look at multiple futures yeah. without, scenarios, having to, yeah. without having to stake our bet on just one, okay. right? Yeah. So that one scenario is, is as you indicated. Another scenario may be that, you know, with clean tech, uh, cleaning up the planet is a good business. It may be that with green, whether it's cap and trade or it's clean technologies, where everybody will invest a little bit, that there could be entirely new economic models that we haven't invented yet that both are sustainable and highly profitable. For instance, I would like to have personal carbon credits and I'd like to trade them with you and exchange them and make a market in that. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I would like to acquire investors in my clean tech deal and have them also put up uh, carbon credits. Right. So I think that there's some exciting new models that might make uh, us being able to maybe not have the high level growth that you have in the past, but be able to create entirely new distributed economic models that individuals and entrepreneurs can help solve some of these problems and make a few bucks or make a few euros at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I, I can agree. You that this, I, I totally agree. I think that the, uh, you know, my next book, From Ego to Eco, talks about this, how we're shifting into a world that basically says that we have to create uh, functional ecosystems, and much of that driven by technology, which distributes the benefit of the ecosystem to all involved parties, right? right? Uh, and if, for example, the oil economy is what I call an ego system. You know, it, it benefits us as drivers, maybe, but it doesn't benefit us as a society, or it stopped, it has in the past, but no longer. So now this, this renewable energy economy is an ecosystem, like a, like a biosphere, right? right? right. And, and this is a whole different cup of tea in terms of how you measure success. Mm -hmm. So that means it's a lateral way of saying that you get some, it's distributed. Uh, and this is much like the internet, you know, yeah. which is a distributed, uh, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer system. Mm -hmm. Our economy will also go in that direction. That is a major uh, challenge for the, uh, you know, the, the 
market logic. Yeah, I, I think I see all that as a natural evolution of economics. Yeah. Every company is going to need to be accountable for the environment, accountable to society, accountable to the consumer. Clearly, though, I, and I think any futurist uh, worth his salt uh, would say, we as a global society have not yet made the commitment to change to be sustainable. And that's a real problem. And um, I, I have a forecast that says it's more likely that corporations, even more so than governments, because governments are always, what government, every government wants is to be elected again, right? right? Yeah. Uh, of course, if you're a dictatorship, then you don't have to worry about that. Right. In North Korea, <laughs> just continue. Not, they're, they're, that's right. They can be both the greatest polluter or the greatest conservative. That would be an ironic and shift. They're very right? successful at that. They're very successful model, right? <laughs> but if you're not uh, uh, Russia or you're not North Korea or you're not a autocracy where the king rules and that's it, uh, then I think you have to be based on taking sustainability as a business model, as a competitive model, as a competitive advantage, very seriously, and we can help you because you can do it both. I think that, that this is, you know, it's a paradigm challenge, right? So if sustainability and, and becoming uh, becoming sort of what, what's called the natural capitalism, you know, that Jeremy Rifkin talks about, yeah. sustainable capitalism, that is an entirely different mindset, and that is becoming the, the mindset of the consumer. Very and there's been lots of research on this saying that over 70% of consumers worldwide, this has been done by Edelman, I think, uh, the number one objective to when they buy stuff is they want to know if this company does the right thing. And right thing means now a bunch of things, not just sustainability. But so I, we're going to see that in five years. I don't think there will be a single company yet left that does not have this on their flag, that they want to do the right thing I and agree. make money. I agree. Yeah. So I so. think the challenge as futurists with our clients, since we've been telling our clients for a long time, uh, you need to get ready for this change, this change is coming, is now, as the change is here, is to help them evolve, help them right. leverage green for competitive advantage, help them understand sustainability, because there's another dimension to this, which is if you're going to attract talent, and clearly I think we would agree mm -hmm. that talent is what drives an organization to success. You have to have the right people. Well, to your point, you've got a majority of talent. They only want to work at a company that's doing the right thing. Yeah. So whether your, your talent strategy, your product or service strategy, uh, how you compete, whether you're a good social steward for the environment, uh, I think we can help and should help create that future blueprint, not just the now, but where is that going to help companies think about how to prepare today mm -hmm. for that green future? That's a big part of what we're doing. Yes, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to use the sort of scenarios where I'm basically uh, showing what's, uh, what's happening, especially with European clients, that five years from now, what is that, uh, what, what's the angle going to be? If you're going to drive a Porsche five years from now, how would you ju go about justifying it or what would the logic behind that you know will it be like the tesla will it be electric or will it be shared or you know shared porsches could could be a scenario that would make it more sustainable right things like that so maybe develop ideas that yeah. would be you know not that yeah. i would want to share a porsche right but <laughs> i guess we'd have to change our minds on that too but this is why avi's bought zip car now eh? yeah. so, same thing so out of those scenarios come the actions that's right but if, uh, if, uh, if you don't believe that the scenario is real, you won't do anything. That's right. Uh, I think the, uh, also, uh, there are outside of the, let's say, if you're in the automobile business, and uh, we worked on some projects with some of the largest, well, the largest automobile uh, conglomerate in the world, Volkswagen, I think the, it's going to be very hard, uh, and again, our job is to help clients who are stuck in their industry thinking, uh -huh. to think outside of the industry so their own industry can be more sustainable. So for instance, I have a forecast that if you're driving a Porsche, which, you know, I like BMW, I drive BMW, uh, I want my Porsche or my BMW or whatever car you're driving, a Ford or whatever, it could possibly generate energy that could contribute to the grid. Yeah. And that energy contributed to the grid with a different kind of engine, a distributed, you know, a cloud-based car and a transportation system, just like the solar on top of my house, is I'm selling back to the grid. I think if we rethink this, and again, this is part of our job, is to help rethink traditional paradigms of business and economics to find new economic opportunities, not just to make money, but also to create sustainable organizations. That's an exciting part of, I think, the future. I think in general, that what the, 
the challenge here is in the opportunity, which I think is a huge opportunity, is not to be uh, have your company be in a silo or in an empire or what's called you know, a, a castle building, you know, which Apple, for example, has been very good at, but is to create a network yeah. uh, that makes sense across the board. And this is the shift that we're seeing. There won't be any companies left, in my view, that are ca castles, or very few of them will be left, because it's very hard to do now to actually be that that monolith. You know, so we're moving from this. Uh, from being the network to being the networked, uh, and and uh, a distributed network, right? And that is, of course, technology is the number one example for that. So Jeremy Rifkin calls this uh, the intergrid, for example, rather than the internet. Yeah, right? same thing. Well, you know, in uh, he, he, a lot of his ideas are uh, interesting, uh, but not that hard to make. In other mm -hmm. words, uh, why isn't every uh, business is buildings? Why aren't the buildings? have embedded intelligence to be able to trade and auction the energy that they don't use at times that they're generating energy that they're not using it. I think a lot of uh, consumers will just buy, stop buying from companies that don't have this. Exactly. Yeah, so in Switzerland, we can't have smart meters. I called our, our electricity, our, our utility, and they don't have, they don't offer smart meters. Right? So I think that basically what's, hap what's happening, if everybody had a smart meter, you know, you could have savings of 20% across the board of the entire electricity bill in, in all countries. We have them here in California. So that, that should become, regardless of privacy issues, you know, that's obviously a huge cost saving that you can achieve by controlling your... Uh, and that becomes basically also a government issue of, uh, of being pressured by, uh, you know, some sort of connected activism like you have on Facebook now. Absolutely. You know, to actually make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I have uh, solar panels that I've installed on my residence that I don't own. Uh, the uh, financing company, the solar company owns them. Uh, I get a reduction in my energy and I'm doing good things back for the environment. The rest of it, the energy they generate, I'm, I'm a distributed hub in a network that then shares that energy savings. It helps the grid, it helps me, and I get to contribute with many other community members in my neighborhood mm -hmm. so that we're able to reduce energy. But we need that model for the planet and businesses that understand that, this is kind of the early stage of this, don't you think? Absolutely. It's like being on the internet in 1994 and now we're here with, with sustainability in 2013. This is a huge opportunity. I think so. Uh, for all, no matter what business you're in. Absolutely. So, uh, great. So, it was nice to talk. Why don't you uh, tell us quickly how people can find you? Oh, yeah. So, you can find me at uh, globalfuturist.com or futureguru.com. Certainly, I'm on Twitter, Future Guru, or my website. Uh, and anytime you need to email myself or my colleague, Gert, tell him how to reach you. Okay, yes. I'm... Uh, well, my name is Gerd, G-E-R-D, and that's pretty much all you need to know. Uh, on the web, I'm number two, right after the gastrointestinal reflux disease. That, that's the first one. Uh, so anyway, futuristgerd.com is my new uh, website going online next week. And, and on Twitter, I'm G. Leonhard or Futurist.